Father, we thank you for the great love and your mercies towards us. We thank you for the opportunities we have of hearing your voice and knowing that you're calling us. Bless us now as we look at some of your patriarchs and the people that you have lost, led in the past. May we see that you're still the same. May we recognize the things you're doing in our life. We pray you'll guide us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, last time I think we ended with Nimrod was the first person bold enough to call himself a king. He, uh, he figured out the people were far enough away from God now that they wouldn't think God is the only king. He could be a king too. So that's what he did. And of course, when he set himself up as a king, he set himself up as a monarch. Okay? Now, a monarchy is the first thing that happens after idolatry. As soon as a person gives up God, you have to have a king. So now you know a little bit about Israel's problem when they wanted a king. <laughs> When people want to have their own government instead of what God says, they have a problem. So, idolatry leads into monarchy. And of course, the word monarch, monos, one, and arche, chief. One chief. So, it, it's one man ruling everybody. And that's how this world was finally set up. One guy at the top of everything all the time. And if you don't look too far away from where we are, you'll find there's one man on top of everybody. <laughs> well, that comes after idolatry. So I'm trying to just expose you to principles of the Bible to show that we live in the midst of things that we don't understand and we just take them for granted and say, well, that's the way things are. No, that's not the way things are. That's the way things are if you're an idolater. Okay? <laughs> well, after idolatry and after the monarchy comes a state. See? And that state under a monarchy is always against God. Hmm? Now that's kind of hard if you would follow that all the way through. Because it's true of every state on the planet that has ever been. They are all against God. Why? Because they take the place of God. And whenever somebody thinks they can take the place of God, you're looking at it. Now, I'm not going to just keep opening things up for you so you can understand what that all means and where the devil has been. But I just want you to see the principles we're working with right at the beginning. Genesis, Abraham we're going to look at today. That's where we find Nimrod, the first king. Okay, so these principles we're looking at that the devil has created... To put men in the place of God, I'll just say this much and you carry it from there. It came out in the Roman Catholic system. And anybody who follows the Roman Catholic system is part of it. Okay? All right, that's all I'm going to say for now. <laughs> we, we need to understand where we really are in history today and what has happened to the church. In the Review and Herald of April 14, 1896, the arch deceiver seduced the people about idols and thus gained supremacy over earthly kingdoms. He considered that to be the God of this world was the next best thing to gaining possession of the throne of God in heaven. 
The son of the devil figured out, well, if I can't be a king anywhere else, I'll be the king here. And the way he's going to be the king here is to be the God of the kings. And so we see Nimrod. In Genesis 12, 1, with that little background, I've got to get over there to Genesis 12, 1. Okay, now it says, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Well, here the world has nations now, and all those nations have kings, and all those kings have a God, which is the wrong one, and their job is to keep the people away from God, the true God. So we see one of the basic elements of idolatry is to keep a person away from the only true God. But there was somebody who wasn't going for it. And his name was Abram. He served the only true God. So God's going to make a people out of him. One man. <laughs> One faithful man is all God needs. Do you suppose we have some in here? I hope so. <laughs> God just needs one faithful man. Well, he found him in Abram. And so here's what he says to him. Abram, get thee out of thy country. And from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now, all of that's important. Well, why? Why did he tell Abram to do this? Abram, Abram was 75 years old. How would you like to move out of every place at 75 <laughs> and go on the street? Yeah, he's 75 years old. He couldn't have been in too bad a shape because he had this beautiful wife. She was 65 years old. And at 65, she was a dazzler. <laughs> I suppose we understand that a little bit more today because we have people today who are 65, they're still on magazine covers. <laughs> so she was one of those. <laughs> so here's this old man and his dazzling wife. And God says to him, get out of your country. Well, now, what was wrong with this country? This country was a nation that had gone from idolatry to monarchy to, <laughs> to go being against God. So God said, get out. They're idolaters. Get out of that country. And by the way, your father is an idolater. You leave him behind. And your children, your whole family is idolaters. Now, how would you like for God to come to you and say, do you have any idolaters in your family? That's where Abraham is. And God says to him, get out. I don't want you with them. 75 years old and go be on the street. Not just off on the street, on the country. Aren't you glad God isn't like that anymore? He <laughs> never changes, does he? Uh-oh, maybe there's something we're not giving. He made him a promise. I will, I will show you a land you can have when you get out. But you'll notice God said, I will show you. He didn't say, look around. He said, I will show you. So get out. Well, we know the Bible says he did it. He got up and he left. And the Bible also says he left not knowing where he was going to go. 
So he got out, and he headed out. Was he headed in the right direction? <laughs> hey, any direction is out. So there he is, out, walking around with his family, <laughs> not knowing where he's going. Was he circumcised? See, usually I talk about these things later, but I, you're a pretty sharp group, and I want to ask you some questions as we go along. I want you to think these things through and see what was happening with him. He was not circumcised. She was not part of God's people yet. She was not what Israel was, circumcised. He was what Israel called uncircumcised. I want you to see that Abraham had faith as a person who was not part of the church. So you can be God's people before you join the church. I think it's very important we understand that when we talk to people. You can be talking to a person who knows nothing about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who loves Jesus, and that's enough. As long as they do what God tells them, not you and through you to them, no, to them. <laughs> when they do what God says, they have faith. And they are like Abraham. Abram. He wasn't Abraham yet. <laughs> he's, he's not circumcised. <laughs> he's not anything. He doesn't even have a country. He's out there, a man without a country. Now, how does that feel? Well, none of us know anything about that. It doesn't have a country. <laughs> okay, let's see what the doubt says here. What on earth could he have told his family? <laughs> that would have made sense. So, what did you say to your wife? Uh, let's go. Oh, where are we going for a trip? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where? I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> Uh, leave your TV set. We can't take it with us. God won't say what else we can leave. That's a good question. What would he told his wife? You mean I can't get my hair done next week? We're talking real life. This is a real man with a real wife. And God told him, get out. And leave your your kindred behind because they're all idolaters. They're my enemies at the present time. They'll drag you down and leave your father. Well, we know the story. Terah went with him and so did some of the family. So we'll talk about that later. They went with Abram. That says something. He must have had their respect because they went with him. They said, man, if he's leaving, we're getting out with him. <laughs> There's something going on here. <laughs> There's more to these stories than what you see hearing. <laughs> okay? We've got to dig. We've got to think. So here he is without a country. So in verse 8 it says, he was called to go into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance. He obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. So here he is absolutely without a country. And the Bible calls him Father Abraham. Why? We're supposed to be his children. Are we his children? Do we have a country? Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I know a few people who think they have a country 
And they get out there and they hand out their political leaflets and they start arguing for people. They have a country. They're not Abraham's children. I'm sorry. They don't know enough to leave politics alone because that's against God. We're reading about it right here. You see, when we studied a little bit about Nimrod and how that works, we found out where the saint came from. And now we are understanding through Genesis 12 the separation between church and state. God is saying, I am not behind the program where you can have politics and me. We'll spend the whole time with that sometime. It's very important because some Adventists get all wrapped up in elections and people and all. They don't know what they're doing. They are in complete disobedience of the Bible. So those who believe God are the children of Abraham. So here he is wandering around. And I don't know what in the world he's looking for because if he can't have a country, what's he looking for? He is a man without a country and God means to keep him that way. I, if that was me, I think I'd start getting a little bit confused. Let's see. He said, get out. He told me, go. What am I looking for? <laughs> he didn't tell me to look for anything. He said he would show me. I guess I have to wait to see what he shows me. So he's wandering around. Now, this is a very intelligent man. (laughs) He's not a dummy. (laughs) Very intelligent man. So he says, well, okay, I don't have a country. I guess I can seek because if a man has a country, he can't seek. He has one. I don't have one. I can seek. I'll just see what God does next. Well, the Bible says that if the people who leave a country are mindful, they can go back. What, what does mindful mean? It means that's where your mind is. You left, you want to go back. <laughs> You're homesick. You want to go visit your old trees again. You want to look at the old streets, see some of the old people. You are mindful of where you left. We won't get into this side of it, but A.T. Jones once did a real interesting thing with this. He was talking to missionaries. He said, are you a missionary? Have you left your country? You can't be a missionary until you leave your country. If you take your country with you, the people you're supposed to be working with and helping are going to know. You have another country. You don't belong there. You're not really helping them. You're just doing something. But you brought your country with you, and when you miss your country bad enough, you're going back. You don't care about these people. You're going home. Which is kind of an interesting point, isn't it, for missionaries? He said, there's only one way you can be a missionary. Leave your country first. Leave it. Don't plan on going back. That's another interesting history. We'll leave that alone for now. (laughs) Now, in Hebrews... About the 11th chapter, it says they desire a better country. That's where it begins. He goes over to chapter 13 and he picks up a better country. Where, what country is that? Heavenly. Heavenly. We've got, we're getting it now. God told Abraham, get out of the United States and desire a better country. Get out of Germany and desire a better country. Get out of... (laughs) Desire a better country. You mean I don't have to get messed up with all this Bush stuff and all this Obama stuff? No. You have a better country. This country is not good enough for you as a child of God. Oh, that's not patriotism, is it? Now, in the book of Romans, we're told, 
hey, wherever you are, you'll be a good citizen. Well, okay, I'll pay my taxes and I'll do all that stuff, but this is not my home. Who am I in this country? A stranger and a pilgrim. Are you a stranger in this country? Are you a pilgrim? You don't have a country in this world? See, until we get out of our country, we're not going to be what God wants us to be. Do you see part of the problem of the Omega? Our people have been tricked into thinking being a good American means you're a Christian. Yeah. We are not supposed to be a good anything in this world except a good citizen wherever we are. You drive down the street, you pay your taxes. You're using the street. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's simple. Romans 4, verses 1 and following. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, that pertaining to the flesh, is found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had after glory, but not before God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God. Now so that was before he was a church member, okay? He believed God. And was, it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham was righteous before he was circumcised. He was righteous before he was baptized. Okay? That's not what we teach people. We tell them, hey man, you've got to do it this way and this way and this way. You have to join the church and then you can be righteous. That's not true. We're really doing a job on people, making them think that they're going to heaven depends on them joining the right church. We have a lot of things to learn. Bible things. It was counted to him for righteousness. Whose righteousness? Jesus only. There is no other righteousness. And Jesus does not come with a denominational name. That's where the bosses are, denominations. I'm reading again. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Now, can I cover my own sins? Absolutely impossible. Only God can do that. Well, if only God can do it, maybe I better wait for Him to say, Your sins are covered. <laughs> And when he says it, I'm supposed to believe it. Because he said it. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Come at this blessedness and then upon the circumcision only? Or upon the uncircumcision also? He's asking the Jews. You see, you think you have to be circumcised to be saved. So he's asking him, well, was Abraham circumcised when he, it was counted to him for righteousness? And they're all sitting there dumbfounded. <laughs> you mean salvation doesn't come because you're a Jew? <laughs> How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He received the sign he received the sign of circumcision. A seal. What is a seal? That, that's, that's something you put on afterwards to close the deal. But there's got to be something happening first. The seal comes to end it, to close it. So he says, he 
received circumcision as the seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful argument? Paul says, God sealed the deal before he was circumcised. Why? Because he had faith. He had faith. He believed. That was between him and God. No church. There are a lot of people in this world that like, would like to know this message, but we can't deliver it because we're selling a church. Do you suppose why I can't preach this in our churches today? That God has us in this little room here for a reason. So nobody can say, don't say that. Don't talk like that. That is not in keeping with some say, oh, that doesn't. Well, I'm glad it's not. I'm happy to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but I want to be a real one. The way God says it. And if it means getting in the way of the system, I'm sorry, system. The system's going down. Spirit Prophecy. One selected message is 204. It's going down because men got in the way. So Paul says... That he, Abraham, might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham which he had being yet uncircumcised. <laughs> so Paul is telling us, let's get like Abraham, the uncircumcised Abraham, and believe God. Now that's a message worth having. <laughs> you can tell it to any person on the street, and tell, you can believe just like Abraham. Oh, what church is that? Forget the church. <laughs> that's the word of God. You believe that's all you have to do. If he wants you in a church, he'll take you a few steps further. You listen to him. So then, Abraham had this faith. And he put him on the streets. Without a country... He was left out there hanging, hanging in the hands of God. And he was uncircumcised. Do we have that kind of faith? We're circumcised. <laughs> We're in the church. Do we have the faith of Abraham? He didn't have a country in this world. You know what? I have an idea that he didn't care. He knew what this world was. So God continues and he says, Thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs. So you are a stranger if you're Abraham's seed in the United States. You don't have a country in this world. You live here. That's good. This is as good a place as I need to live. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty good place to live, even now. But it's not our country. We have a better country. So the question is, am I really Abraham's seed? Or do I still have a country? So now we know there's a state. Nimrod was the first one. We also know God wants a separation of church and state. That's Abraham. Get out of your country. Well, Nimrod shows us a little more of how it works. Let's back up just a little bit. Nimrod was the son of Cush. Cush lived in Ethiopia. Cush was the son of Ham who was the son of, of course, Noah. So if you follow the genealogy of Nimrod, he takes you right back to Egypt. 
That's who he was. He represented Egypt, the way Egypt thinks. That was his country. And so when he established his kingdom, he established something that Egypt eventually followed. They had their kings, their pharaohs, their... Okay? Now, to follow this down, the pharaohs were monarchs. Okay? One top dog. But they were under a god. They were the king on earth, but they had a god that they represented. And that god was Ra, the sun. Their god was the sun god. And they had many different sects in those days, different, different kinds of sun gods. And finally, around the time of Moses, they decided, this isn't working. We've got too many sun gods. We're only going to have one sun god. So the state determined, we're only going to have one sun god. It's going to be the sun up there, and every symbol of him would be a disc. And so in the hieroglyphs of the Egyptians, you see a, a disc with different forms around it, but always a disc. And if you want to find that disc today, just go to your doctor's office because they have a pole with a disc with snake going around. That's the god of the doctors, the MDs, Escalapius. It's an Egyptian symbol for the sun god. So Egypt is still with us. <laughs> and you just be careful the next time you go on doctor because he has sworn an oath <laughs> to that sun god. <laughs> Do no harm. And do you know what? He had his fingers crossed behind his back when he said it. If it makes money, he's going to do you some harm. And you better believe it makes money because whether he helps you or not, he's going to get paid. <laughs> if you die, he's going to get paid. Escalapius, Egypt, sun god, it all, it's all a big thing. The devil knows what he's doing. The church doesn't seem to understand these things. Ellen White did. She was really down on the physician. Oh, she wrote a lot of things to the physicians. Entire books. She asked them the question, why should you be paid more than a minister? If you're a missionary and a pastor's a missionary, why should you make more money than he does? Well, I won't get into that anymore because our ministers have their own set of problems. So then, get out of your country. Well, suppose you move from Florida to Nebraska and God told you to get out of your country. And people say, well, he really didn't get out of his country. He's still in the country. Yes, he got out of his country. Well, then, how did he get into a new country? Jesus told us that one, too. He said, be born again. You were born in the United States. This is your country. You get out of it, you've got to be born again into his country. <laughs> You're a citizen of a new country. Oh, I'm not. I don't want to look at that. I'm going to get myself in the wrong place here. So, the Egyptians had their sun god, and Pharaoh was the under god under him, the king. So he was the son of the sun. That's what they called themselves. S-O-N of the S-U-N. But even back then, they knew if you were the son of God, there was only one of you. The further back you go into history, the smarter they seem to get. Because they knew real things that the theologians down through the years have corrupted. The longer we live on this earth, the harder the theologians make it to understand the Bible. I'm throwing all these little things in for free. It's not our study today. <laughs> so the son of the sun, obviously the sun is what gives life. So Pharaoh and all the other kings became the only one who could get life. And they had an interesting way of proving it. If you didn't believe it, they took your life. <laughs> Which kind of was, was the real uh, 
Well, anyhow. Okay. So then Abraham said, I well, was told, I will show you the land. So Abraham separated from his country. He left. And secondly, from his father's house. You remember who his father was? Terah. Yeah, the first Hebrew in the Bible, Terah. And Terah died on the trip. So he left his father behind. That's step number two. See? And the kindred. Well, do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? The last of the kindred was named Lot. And when they got to the land, they said, well, we have too much stuff. We're going to get in each other's way. way. We're going to bump into each other. You tell me where you want to go, and I'll go the other way. (laughs) And so Lot said, well, I like it over there. It's pretty over there. It's got lots of green trees. I hear the amusement parks. Uh, I want over there. And Abraham said, go. I'll go this way. He left his kindred. So now Abraham has left his country, he's left his father who died, and he has left his kindred. He's done everything God had told him to do. Did you notice God has not shown him the land yet? He's not going to show it to him till he did all three things. So when God says something to you, you better pay attention because he means exactly what he says. So after... After he's done all three things, now God says, okay, look around. And Abraham says, look around? Yeah, look look to the west, look to the east, look to the north, and look to the south. So Abraham is looking around. And God says, everything you see, I'm going to give to you. At your seed, forever. Now, it's at this point in the story that all the churches get all confused. Even our own men have gotten confused. Even A.T. Jones was confused. I'm sorry. For the people who are listening to this, uh, write to me. We'll uh, talk about it. So, he looked. Now then, spiritually, Abraham saw something, but he was not only spiritual. He also knew how to live in this world. So he looked at the land, and God said to him, I'm going to give this to you and your seed, which are going to be like stars in the sky. Who can number all the stars? And like the sands out there of the oceans that cannot be numbered. Well, I'm not going to get into A.T. Jones here. I'll leave that for another time. We'll just say that when God said that, he meant the word seed was the posterity of Abraham. There are those who go to Galatians 3 and they take that one little scripture and they say, no, it doesn't mean that. It means Christ only. Well, they're misusing Galatians 3. They're not understanding it. You can't take one scripture of the Bible and think you know everything about the Bible. You've got to see what the rest of the Bible says. So God said, I'm going to give it to your seed, your posterity. And Abraham's thinking about this. He says, I'm 75 years old with a 65-year-old wife out here in the middle of nowhere with no country. My kindred are gone. My father's dead. I'm 75 years old, and I'm going to have seed that's going to fill this earth. (laughs) I don't even have one. (laughs) Well, that might seem like a challenge. I don't know. (laughs) So anyhow, here we are. He told him, look. Now, if he had looked before God told him to look, what do you think he would have seen? Nothing. (laughs) He would have seen what everybody else sees. And everybody else is not going to heaven. I'm sorry. The Jews, when God had them become his people later, they didn't see what God told Abraham, and they rejected Jesus. Yeah. 
Because they didn't see what Abraham saw. They thought the land God gave them was that place that the Romans wanted. And they wanted Jesus to give it to them. And since he wasn't going to do that, they said, he's not the Messiah. They didn't understand anything about what God did with Abraham. I can prove that. When Moses, we talked a little bit about him last time, when Moses became the real leader after he was 40 years old when he mistook what God told him about being a leader and he killed a, an Egyptian. You see, he made the one big bad mistake that we make after we're baptized. We think now we're saved. And then we say, well... I'll just do what the church does. Bad, bad mistake. And Moses got out there to prove that he was a leader of the people. He protected one. He killed that Egyptian, but he forgot to do something. He forgot to ask God what he should be doing. <laughs> so he just did his own thing. He was a leader. And so he left and did the wrong thing. Well, Moses, you remember this is the man who was going to be the next king of the world. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? He was going to be the next king of the world. There's no question about it. There's nobody else who could have taken that away from him. Nobody. He is the next pharaoh, and that represented. But he turned his back on it. He said, I would rather suffer reproach for Christ then have all the pleasures of Egypt including the being king but he had stuff in him there was stuff Egypt still Egypt in him and even though he was willing and he was equipped and he wanted God to teach him God says well I've got a project here <laughs> this is going to take 40 years <laughs> I don't know about you, I don't have 40 years left. No, God has to put me on a better plan than he had Moses on. 40 years to get all this stuff out of him. So when he was 80 years old, finally, he was ready because he wasn't ready. When a man says, I'm going to do this for God, God's going to say, sit down. When a man says, oh, not me, Lord, oh, not me. Come on, you're ready. Yeah, God knows who he can use. It's the people that are worthless. He says, I can use you. It's the weak ones. The ones that say, oh, not me, Lord, I'm in some room. No, I want you. Because then people will know, it's me doing it, not you. They're going to see who you are. Yes, that's how God works. So here we are, Moses. He's 80 years old. And he's going to be out there for another 40 years with these people who just, the only thing they know how to do is complain and murmur and say, you took us out of Egypt. That's where we want to be. Now, I'm proving something to you. They did not get out of Egypt. <laughs> God said, get out of the country. And they said, we're taking it with us. They got out there and they said, man, we've got to eat cornflakes. But back there, we get leeks. We get onions. We get these wonderful steaks. They never left Egypt. They didn't do step number one. Have we, as Seventh Day Adventists, left Egypt yet? You know what Egypt is, don't you? What is the sign of in the Bible? Exodus 22. Good. We'll, we'll come to that. 
What did Abraham see when God told him, look? What he saw? Iraq, he saw Syria, he saw Greece, he saw Italy, he saw... Yeah, he saw all that. Do you think he was interested in that? <laughs> it wasn't any better than where he came from. <laughs> and God told him to get out. No, God told him, look up. That's what he told him. Look up. Well, you can't see all those places when you look up. He said, I see a city whose maker and builder is God. That's where I want to go. And God says, that's what I'm promising you. That you will live forever with me as the king. Are you getting now where we're going with this? There's a place where I am the king. And Abraham says, that's where I want to go. That's a perfect government. A perfect king. That's my home. That's my country. And God said, I'm going to give it to you. There's a condition. It's found in Galatians 3. I didn't say to seeds as of many, but as of one. When you believe in Christ, you are one with Him. That's the one. And I'm going to make it so that all the multitude becomes one with Him. All the believers, no matter how many become Christians, they're still only going to be one. One head. One body. That's what John missed. One head. Jesus. One body. All the believers like the sand of the sea, like the, the stars. You can't get rid of those numbers. But all of them together make one. Christ. That's what Paul was trying to tell us. So there is no salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus. If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Well, you know, the Egyptians were kind of tough. And if that wasn't bad enough, with Abraham wandering around, there was a famine. So now there's nothing to eat. So he had no country, no kindred, no father, and no food. <laughs> now this is becoming a problem. So he went into Egypt. They had food there. Okay? He went to Egypt. And it was God's plan that he go to Egypt. He just didn't decide to go there because God told him about Egypt. And God said, no, you go there. There's food there. He said, but I'm going to fix it where you're going to live. You still have to live in this world. This is not going to be your... This, this kind of stuff is not going to be yours forever. It's going to be much better than that. But you still have to live in this world now. So I have picked the place for you to live. Do you remember where Abraham ended up with his family? The word is Goshen. <laughs> See you in there. <laughs> He's talking to God. Why Goshen? Because Goshen was here, and all the trade routes to Egypt had to go to Goshen. Yeah. All these people from around the world empire had to go through there to get to the big place. They all had to get past Abraham and his people. And so God fixed it so that everybody in the world would know about the only true God. <laughs> Do you think that's important to him? <laughs> all the pioneers do this. Gushing. So that the only true God could be known because there is no salvation without that knowledge. 
Oh, this just keeps getting better. I'm sorry. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> the more you know about the Bible, the more you have to wonder, how did we get so far away from it? So, God planted His people in Goshen. Now, we're talking about at least 215 years of activity right there at that center. Now, the Bible says 400 years, 135 years. People get all confused. Now, the children of Israel were there from Jacob till the departure 215 years, okay? I don't want to defend that for now. So here they are, and they're multiplying, and they're scaring pharaohs. It says they're swarming. They're like bees. What are we doing with these people? They're going to be more than us eventually. <laughs> so this is going on. Well, before all of this happens, there's another name we need here. Moses was going to be the pharaoh. That's hot tops. That's tops. You don't get any higher than that. But there was another man who was right next to that, that God planted there too. Next to Pharaoh, Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. And he had Joseph in that position for the very same reason. So that all of the big people in Egypt government would know the only true God through Joseph. You see, God keeps doing this. Somebody's going to tell people there's only one true God. So we have Moses. We have Joseph. And you know, Joseph never got out of Egypt. He died. Abraham died. And all this is going on. But there was a promise there was going to be a departure. That word means exodus. And Joseph knew about that. He says, when I die, yeah, you take my bones. Don't you bury me. When God keeps his promise to you people, you take me with you. <laughs> he says, because I want to be where Abraham is when this ends up. See? That's pretty smart, don't you think? <laughs> I think I'd like to be with Abraham too. <laughs> the promise is made to Abraham and to his seed. That's everybody who's in Christ. One seed. So it was time, the time of the promise, and Moses is out there for 40 years thinking about it. It's time. It's going to be fulfilled now. The promise God made to Abraham and to his seed, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So the promise is made to Abraham and to everybody who is in Christ. And God is talking about an inheritance to Abraham. I don't know whether we should get too far into that. The inheritance is not what people get. An inheritance is what is given. See? The inheritance is God's inheritance that he gives. He did this with Jesus. You read Hebrews 1, 1 through 5 carefully. And Jesus is called the Son of God. And he had everything the Father has by inheritance. It came from the Father. Okay? You study that carefully. There's a lot in that little section. So we are going to have inheritance with Abraham through Christ. So the people of Israel picked up Joseph's bones. I'm sorry, yeah, Israel. And I'm just thinking, I thought here, I have to think through more, but when the people of Israel were taken out of Egypt, they didn't leave thy country so much voluntarily. It says, Pharaoh, put them out of the country. <laughs> Well, who put them out? 
See? He means what he says. I'll watch you out. If you're not going to get out by yourself, I'm going to see you get a little help here. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to take you out of Egypt. <laughs> but we know they never left it behind. They took it with them. <laughs> That was part of it. that first group's problem. They never made it to the promised land. All but four people died. Caleb, Joshua, and the two sons of Aaron, the priests. You, I know people don't. They always say too. But keep reading. Keep reading. You have believed a lot of fairy tales. I'm just exposing you to some of them. I had I had an email just this morning that says I think I learned everything backwards, and I wrote back and says you did. What else can you get from people? That's all they know. Backwards is backwards. You have to stop relying on people and start reading the Bible and the Spirit prophecy for yourself and read it carefully because you're reading things and seeing them the way somebody told you to read it instead of reading it the way it reads. It's different. I'm still finding things after all I've been through all these years. I'm still finding things that I think of a certain way, but then I look at it again and say, it doesn't say that. It really doesn't say that. <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to give up all the errors we learned. It's going to take us too long to find it. <laughs> but we've got to get back to the basics, the pillars of the church, the pillars. That's God's message. All right, we're just looking at a few things right now. The poor people, they were out there 40 years. Did God mean for them to be there 40 years? That wasn't His plan, was it? After He took them out of Egypt, it takes four days to get from that position over to the Promised Land. Four days in a jeep, 11 hours. But they didn't make it. Why? God said, when I take you through that water, how does he take a person through water? When I take you through that water and you get to the other side and Pharaoh and all of his people are still in the water, Then when you get to the other side, the people who see all of this are going to say, Oh, keep them away from me. Don't let those kind of people around here. God says, I'll make them shake in their boots. And you'll walk right straight through them to the promised land. Four days. And what the children of Israel say. We can't do that. We can't do that. Look at the walls on Jericho. I mean, they're... They said, no, God, we don't believe you. You're not going to make those people shake for us. God is a liar. You know, that's what a person is saying when they don't believe God. You think about that. When God says something, that's what he means. And if people don't believe him, they get another 40 years. And guess what? That 40 years is not going to help. That's just time enough to get everybody killed. It's not time to get smart. It's time to die. That 40 years did not educate anybody. They all died because of their unbelief. Well, those people had another thing they had to face every day, every day, every day, every day while they were alive for 40 years. That was Joseph's bones looking at him. Yeah, they were carrying him around the whole time. <laughs> and just the fact that Joseph was with them was a rebuke to their unbelief because he said, you take my bones because I know that God's going to do what he says. So there it was. I had to look at those bones. In uh, Exodus 6, Verse 1 and following, it says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. 
See what God's going to do to the king of the world. That's what Moses thought he was going to be, isn't it? He says, I'm going to show you what I do to the king of the world. <laughs> the big shot. <laughs> the one who's taken my place. Who makes the world not believe in me. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. By the name of the Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, was I not known by them. Yeah, they didn't know the name Jehovah. That's a personal name. Almighty is just terms. God. They didn't know about Father. All they knew was God. He said, but you, Moses, you're different. I talk to you face to face. You know me. You know my name. I am that I am. And so he's telling Moses something here. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. I have remembered my covenant. What did God mean by that? I, rem- I have remembered. Did he forget? <laughs> no, God didn't forget. He's saying, it's time. It's time to do what I told Abraham. And Moses knew it was time. Joseph had figured out it was time. So they were now going to be given something. The possession of the land. But it was not the promise where the city was of God. It was only a place for them to live. With God as the king. Do you see what he's trying to teach them? It's supposed to be a theocracy. God is supposed to be their king. And other nations are supposed to look at this and say, How is this possible? These people live. They don't have an army. We all have armies. (laughs) They don't pay taxes. We all pay taxes. They don't do anything we do with our governments. They don't have a head man. How do these people live? God is their king. What do we know about that? God is their king. That's what God promised them. First you do it here on earth, and then we're taking you home to the heavenly Canaan. That's been missed by a lot of people. But that's the Bible message here. At this point, we have to ask, do we want Israel's experience? No, nobody wants Israel's experience. They didn't believe God when he said something. We don't want that experience. We see what it comes in. They all died out there in that desert. Because God can't save a person that won't believe Him. He can't do it. That would mean He's forcing them. And He can't force anybody. I don't want Israel's experience. Unbelief. Unbelief. If we don't see any more than Israel saw, we're going to get what Israel got. Jesus in the New Testament said, lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh. I'm coming back again for everybody who's ready. And it's too late to get ready when you see the cloud. It's for the people who are ready all the time. 
We don't want to be Israel. They blew it big time. Can't be that Israel. Next time we're going to talk about spiritual Israel. Okay, and what that means. It's the people they never became. Well, we'll close with this. Exodus 15. Verse 1. They went through where there had been a sea. Now, I know this is on CD, and I don't like saying things that are in CDs that I have to explain. But I'm going to say something, and people are going to have to deal with it and find it for themselves. The Bible says they went through the waters. How did they do that? Well, they weren't there anymore, right? What happened? Well, the Bible says God blew. And... But the Bible doesn't tell us at that place what he blew, his, what kind of error he was blowing. That's in another place. It's over in Psalm 147. You get a clue. But what he did, it says they went through on dry land. How do you make land under a stream or a river or a... How do you make it dry? Well, we say, well, he blew it dry. No, he did something else. He made it hard. How do you make water hard? You think about that for a moment. How do you make it stand up? Ellen White says it was solid walls. Wait a minute. Blowing on something does not make something solid unless... It's cold enough. Have you ever seen solid water? What's it called? Ice. What's the big mystery here? God stopped that river right to that section by setting up two blocks of ice all the way across with permafrost in the bottom and they walked across. Looking at these walls of ice <laughs> on that hot day, it's been very comfortable. <laughs> like I said, I'm not going to defend any of this. I think people are missing out on a lot of very good things just because my theology didn't say that. So they walked through. By the way, Somebody did say, and I'm not going to go through the history of this church on every band here. Haskell said it before the general conference. Walls of ice. Our pioneers knew things. And, and the scholars said, they laugh at them. They said, oh, oh, what superstitious drivel. Oh, how dumb. I don't think it's so dumb. I'm not trying to convince anybody either. You either yeah. find it for yourself or you don't care. I don't care either. But I can see those blocks of ice that God pulled out in permafrost and they walked through there, no problem. And all he had to do was warm it up when the Egyptians were in the middle. And that's the end of those Egyptians. By the way, that's here in Exodus 15. Let me read it to you. Then, after they were through on the other side, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed glory to the horse and his rider and he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he is become my salvation. How many? He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. This is a song they're singing. They're singing a song of triumph over Pharaoh on the other side. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts have he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. 
Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed to pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou settest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble, and with a blast of thy nostrils. The waters were gathered together, the floods stood upright as in heat, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. <laughs> now that's an interesting word. <laughs> it doesn't say dry, it says congealed. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. I'm going to stop there. Were the children of Israel redeemed? God said so. He redeemed them. He bought them. He purchased them. And he says, Come, my children, let's build the only nation on God, uh, on this earth that has God as the king, the ruler. Let's go. And after all that, they said no. They said no. Stakes are down. Are we going to do any better today? Is this people the last people on the earth that can do anything right? Are we going to get there? Step number one, leave thy country. Leave your heathen father. Leave your kindred relatives. And I'll give you the land. I'll give you the city as a possession forever in Jesus Christ. Next time we're going to talk about spiritual Israel. Father, we thank you that you have made these things known to us. There's so much we still don't know, but we know enough. All we have to do is work with what you saw us. As we walk in the light that you give us, you'll show us more. But there's no sense in showing us more if we're not going to do what we've already been told. Help us, Lord, to get away from this world's thinking. The entire world has been sold to Satan. He has deceived everybody, including the churches. Help us. Help us to be honest and to have you speak to us that we may glorify your name in this world. May we say there is a true God. I know I serve him. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.